welcome to the fourth session of this year's uh, webinar, Digital Materialities. As people come in, I'll introduce our speaker uh, for tonight. It is my great honor to have uh, John Stiles. Um, I'm also admitting people in, so uh, excuse me, suddenly I go vacant. Um, uh, who is Emeritus Professor in History uh, at the University of uh, Hertfordshire and a fellow, uh, research fellow at the uh, VNA and um, at the VNA. Um, he wrote a, a wonderful book in 2009 uh, called The Dress of the People. He's also the man behind uh, the no less wonderful exhibition at the founding hospital um, called Threads of Feeling, uh, for which he also wrote the, 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 the book, the catalog. Uh, and he's obviously written uh, uh, countless, very important articles on textile and material culture. Um, so uh, with no further ado, I will allow John Stiles to share his screen. Obviously, we're all familiar with uh, Zoom webinars now, so I see that everybody's got their um, uh, microphones uh, switched off. Obviously, uh, during question and answer, you're more than welcome uh, to switch your cameras back on um, if you so wish and uh, unmute yourself and ask your questions directly to John. Okay, well, thank you for that very flattering introduction. I'll go to uh, share screen. Um, and right, if is that all okay? Uh, so we're seeing your uh, um, desktop as well ah. at, at this point. Um, we okay. see the slides, but and they're moving. Yep. Because so maybe so, I think you you need to restart the sharing. I think yeah, I better do that again. Yeah, stop because it's the, the um, right. Ah, oh, my. Um, so we're with John now, Holger. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, I've lost my turn the on the full tip, but the, the slideshow. Slideshow has disappeared. Ah. That's the problem I'm having, window. Uh, PowerPoint slideshow. Um, ah, there we go. Right. I shall go back to the beginning. Bear this, with is, this is what this is what comes of having a practice. Yeah. I'm afraid. Right um, now, is that working? So at the moment, we don't see any screen. We just see everybody's little. Oh, okay. Um, right, just a minute. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, take your time. Um, I guess it's a, um, it worked fine when we did the test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Zoom meeting. Now, now I've all oh, right. We'll go to slide. We'll try this again. Um, maybe if you start your PowerPoint, and then you, when you share the screen, you'd select that window. Yeah. I've, I've got. I'm going to close everything and open it all up again. Right. Okay. Okay, that's work. Now that should come up. Yes. And now I can make that full screen. Fantastic. Great. We got the, yeah, it's it's obviously when you practice, you then have to shut everything down and then start it all up again to get it right. Okay. okay we've got there again. Right. <laughs> well, apologies, everybody, for that slight hiatus, but here we go. Um, 
Okay, what's in the word? John Hoker's Livre des Chantillons. And what I'm going to offer today is really some fairly informal reflections on uh, my experience shared with Ariane in putting together the book we've just published, which is the Hoka album in English, uh, which is a facsimile reproduction of the uh, set of uh, over a hundred uh, swatches, textile swatches from the middle of the 18th century, mainly from Lancashire and growing out of the Lancashire cotton industry, uh, that are now in a, an album in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris. Um, and this involved us in a very close engagement with issues around, uh, I suppose, the relationship between things, words, and numbers, um, because Hoka's album is not unique, but certainly very distinctive in the way it has the objects, the swatches, it has Hoka's commentary on the objects, and in the commentary are both uh, names that are given to the objects and prices uh, which Hoka considered uh, the objects uh, were being uh, cost to make in terms of their materials, and particularly the prices at which they were sold. Uh, I, we presume the selling prices he offers are, are probably wholesale prices. So Hoka, Hoka's album forces, forced us, uh, as we worked on the project, to put together our thoughts about that relationship. I mean, in a sense, the Hoka album is a kind of holy grail of material culture scholarship because it does have the things, the words used to describe them and the way, especially given they were, given they were commercial objects, the way they were evaluated in the commercial marketplace. And I'm, I'm, I'm particularly gonna focus on printed textiles in the Hoka album, because I think they raise uh, these issues in a particularly clear uh, and, uh, and in some ways unsettling uh, manner. Okay, well, and why, wh why are prints very prominent in the Hoka album? Um, the reason is simple, that the French government made it a priority in the middle of the 18th century to come to a decision over whether to allow for the French textile industry to produce printed textiles, something which had been uh, banned in the late 17th century and which was very tendentious. Um, during what historians often term the calico craze of the late 17th century, uh, as many of you uh, watching this will know, the East India Trading Companies, the European East India Trading Companies, brought huge numbers of cotton fabrics to Europe, and these caused something of a sensation uh, across uh, Western Europe. But when we talk about the calico craze, what we're usually talking about is cotton textiles, and it's cotton textiles printed or painted using colorfast techniques, uh, which came uh, from India. Uh, we're particularly talking about prints on calico, what was often at the time called chintz. And Hoka referred to them in his book of swatches as chintz cottons printed. So he's emphasizing this word chintz, he's emphasizing the fact they were cotton, and he's emphasizing the fact that they're printed with these uh, Indian derived color fast techniques. Um, now, of course, they weren't necessarily Indian because uh, this technique, these Indian techniques were already in the later 17th century being mimicked uh, or attempted to be mimic mimicked uh, in various parts of Europe, particularly uh, in the Netherlands and in, um, and in England. Um, and these uh, fabrics were incredibly successful. You see here, uh, they were being worn by uh, all classes of people in, in Britain by the mid uh, middle of the 18th century. This is a street seller in London portrayed by uh, John Collett, uh, who's wearing something that probably represents a bedgown made out of printed cotton or linen. But there are problems here. First of all, uh, we undertook a lot of my microscopy uh, work on the fabrics. We're using USB, this, this type of USB microscope. And one rapidly discovers that many of the prints Hoka included 
uh, in his swatches uh, were not all cotton, but uh, many of them consisted of a mixture of cotton and linen. And also comparative, uh, as you can see here, here's one of the, you, the, the linen is the shiny vertical warp yarns uh, at magnification. The cotton is the much more fluffy, uh, softer, uh, less shiny uh, uh, weft yarn. And we'll come back to that slide later. Um, but also because Hoka was taking these uh, English fabrics, Lancashire fabrics uh, to France, uh, comparative historical study also re reveals that the French were in the early 1750s when Hoka undertook this exercise, already making printed co cottons when the album was compiled. And particularly that was true in Marseille, uh, on the French Mediterranean coast um, and Marseille and other areas in the uh, in Italy uh, and indeed in Spain had been producing uh, printed cottons and these are all cotton fabrics that the, the, these sent Mediterranean European centers had been producing printed cottons um, since the uh, well back into the 17th century. So why was the French government so interested in these English? printed textiles if somewhere in France was already producing in, as you see in 1736, uh, exactly these sorts of uh, textiles. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that working on the Hoka album highlighted for us the fact that the story of European printed textiles is not one of straightforward copying or direct adaptation of Indian textile practices. Um, but rather, I want to suggest that Indian printed and painted fabrics, cotton calicos and chintzes, and an Indian technique, color fast textile printing and painting, were certainly the origin of much of these developments. Um, and they were certainly in the process over a long extended period of becoming domesticated in Western Europe. Um, but if one ex but but that that was an extended uh, and quite complicated and and inconsistent uh, process, and that examining the materiality of these textiles and their relationship to textile names and textile prices can help us understand that process. So, in other words, the acquisition and adaptation of uh, textile techniques that ultimately derived or largely from Indian practice involved a complicated web of multi-directional international relationships, which embraced in particular India, the Levant, England, and France. And these international relationships were articulated through transfers, four types of transfers in particular, transfers of goods, of course, the, the, the passage between places of raw cotton, the passage of intermediate goods such as yarn or plain fabric, and of course, the, the passage of finished printed textiles. Secondly, there was the transfer of skills and processes. Thirdly, transfers of people. And fourthly, transfers of patterns and designs. But these transfers weren't uniform in character and happened in different ways in different places. Now, I'm not gonna be able to go through all these different modes of transfer in, in, in great detail, but I'll try and touch on all of them to some degree or another. But let's start with words. And first of all, I want to start with what we might call new words. And the new word I really want to explore here is the word calico craze, which has become a very, very common way of describing the origins of this process in the late 17th century. Historians and scholars of literary scholars and others seem to really adore this phrase, the calico craze. Now, in some ways, this is very odd because this phrase calico craze actually originates in the United States, particularly in New England, in the 1880s. Um, to, to make that point, I'll quote from a, a journal called The Bulletin, published at Philadelphia, uh, which reported in August 1885, quote, a calico craze in New England. The calico fever has now reached here, says the Amesbury, Massachusetts correspondent. 
very many young ladies are already appearing in neat calico suits, which look very attractive. So this is, the, we now think of calico craze as this, this notion that applies to the late 17th century, but actually it, it, the, 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 the phrase was first used uh, talking about a period a hundred years later in a very different uh, sort of calico. What the reason for that, and I think this is this is important and instructive, is that the calico craze applied to the late 17th century as a description of what was going on in, in cotton textiles um, is actually quite a recent coinage. That for most of the 20th century, scholars in the decorative arts in particular, but also historians uh, and textile historians didn't use that construction. They used the, the phrase, the India craze, which originates, as far as I can see, in furniture history in the 1920s, and then was extensively reused in the 1950s after the publication of Wilhelm Sloman's famous, famous uh, study of the, called Bizarre Designs in Silks. And Sloman came up with the idea that there's a, a certain type of early 18th century silk design, which he named bizarre. It wasn't called bizarre in the 18th century, um, which derived from particularly from India. Uh, and this led to a huge controversy. He was attacked by people like John Irwin, uh, saying this isn't true at all, that what you, it's much more Chinese influence. And anyway, it's a form of European exoticism constructed in Europe, uh, taking on elements from Asian, East Asian and South Asian uh, design. Um, and that India craze uh, went on being used until the 1980s. What's significant there is that for textile historians, is that the focus was silk, not cotton. Uh, Sloman talks about cotton a little, but his whole emphasis is on silk. And the first person I found who used the notion calico craze in the way we use it now was actually the, the British historian of France, the wonderful British historian of France, Owen Houghton, who in 1980 first used that phrase calico craze. And, and maybe it's actually because she was a historian of France and because calico, as we'll see, was completely outlawed in, in France for a long period in the early, early 18th century, that meant she was sensitive to the calico cotton side of the issue, as opposed to the silk side of the issue. But anyway, I, 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 I think it's important to stress that we've ended up in a place where it's calico is thought of as printed cotton fabrics. And we talk about the calico craze as if that's what it was about. But actually there are lots of, from, that's very recent. And that the impact of Asia, and of course, when we say in, when when historians said India craze, what they were talking about was really the Indies in general, not just in in the sense it was used in the 17th century, not just South Asia, but also East Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, that we've narrowed this idea of Asian influence down to printed calicos. Whereas, in fact, in its origins, uh, the, the consideration of the impact of Asian goods was much, much broader. Well, that's a new word. Let's think about some old words. Um, and here I'm thinking about the word, the word chintz. Um, sorry, let me move that on a bit. Um, I've got slightly a lot. I don't know why this is. Uh, uh, I'm having some problems here, I'm afraid. Um, just, I may have to go back because I don't. I don't seem to be able to move back through my slides. Take your time. Yeah, it's hopeless. They very odd. Oh, here we are. Okay, done it now. It's different bits of my computer responding in different ways, which is confusing. Okay, so old words. 
Well, the word, the old word I want us to think about here, there is there were really two old words. One is calico and one is chintz, uh, both of which are European, particularly English, adaptations of various uh, South Asian uh, words uh, to do with cotton fabrics. Now, the word chintz had various overlapping meanings in 18th century British usage, but they all embraced printing or painting in multiple colours using Indian colour fast techniques. Uh, but increasingly, in the course of the 18th century, it came to mean fabrics printed with multiple colours, usually more than five, on fabric that wasn't necessarily all cotton, but included at least some cotton, although there are linen printed chintzes. Um, what I think is important to grasp is that the term chintz did not necessarily imply, as has sometimes been assumed, an all Indian, uh, an all cotton Indian fabric printed or painted in India with a design in an Indian style. Um, now, in both Britain and France, the state imposed mercantilist restrictions on cotton textile manufacturing in the late 17th and early 18th centuries with the aim of safeguarding their much larger, larger woolen and silk industries from the competition of Indian printed and painted fabrics. And then the British prohibition was in some ways more restrictive than the French, but in other words, more, in other ways, more per permissive. Imports of calico were banned in England in 1700. And I've put this slide up, this is uh, from the Act, to see uh, that what the definition of calico was. Now here it says, uh, all wrought silks, bengals and stuffs mixed with silk or herber, and all calicos painted, dyed, printed or stained there. So that was the original statement, but they actually passed an Act the following year to clarify and this not only names what muslins are, which uh, is, is another whole other um, can of worms when it comes to nomenclature, but um, let's not go into that right now. Uh, but what it does here is say, um, and the previous act, by painted, dyed and stayed calicos mentioned in the said act of the 11th year of His Majesty's reign, the one we've just seen, for laying the said duty of 15 pounds, blah, 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 are meant, what are meant, not only all calicos painted, dyed or stained after the weaving thereof, but all such whereof the yarn or other materials were painted, dyed or stained before the making of such calicos. So for, for in, in English law, calico means everything that is a colored cotton fabric, whether it's printed or painted or loom patterned or tie, you know, tie dyed, or, and in fact, most, uh, almost all dyed uh, calicos except, uh, except blue. Um, so this is a much broader definition than the one we usually associate with the calico craze, which is focused very narrowly on painted and printed calicos. That's not what these people meant. They mean something much, much broader. It's basically banning almost all uh, Indian colored cotton fabrics. So it's not just this. It extends to all these, uh, uh, all these other uh, types of Indian fabrics. Now, France, too, prohibited the manufacture, import and wearing of all printed textiles, whether Asian or European, including cotton, linens and mixes of the two. So the, the French prohibition was very specifically targeted at printed fabrics. It just banned all of those. But it's a rather different, as you see, in a rather different prohibition from the British one, which is um, in some ways uh, more comprehensive, but in other ways less demanding. Um, for a while, at least, the British one allowed uh, people to go on wearing printed fabrics as long as they were printed in, uh, in England, uh, whereas the French just banned the lot. The only exception was the free port of Marseille, as we've seen, where printing uh, was allowed on plain cotton textiles, uh, textiles which were imported, of course, generally not from India, but from the Levant. Uh, and then they could only print them for export, not for use in the rest of France. Uh, and the industry at Marseille prospered, but on a rather limited scale. In Britain, too, 
a prohibition was imposed finally in 1721 on the sale or use of any, quote, painted, printed, stained or dyed calico. So you couldn't wear any of this stuff, whether it was printed in India or printed in Britain. Yet significantly, it didn't extend to printed mixes of cotton and linen like this one uh, you see on the slide, or to all linen printed fabrics, nor did it apply to printed and painted Indian calicos exported to the British colonies in the Americas. And by adapting to these constraints, in other words, by being allowed to continue printing, but only on certain fabrics, in contrast to the French, who were not allowed to print at all unless they happened to be in the town of Marseille. Um, by adapting to these constraints, the British textile printing industry boomed. By the middle of the 18th century, it was considered to be, and this was considered by other European textile printers, to be producing the best quality printed fabrics in Western Europe. And that's why uh, the French state was so interested in finding out about English printed textiles. And that's why they're so prominent in uh, the Hoka album. Okay, so let's think, let's move from words and, uh, words and laws um, to raw materials. Now, Cotton, of course, is not widely grown in Western Europe, but there was a long-standing industry spinning and weaving cotton, fustian, which was a cotton and linen mixture. And that had been developed in the Middle Ages in Italy, later in Germany and on to France and England and the Netherlands. Uh, and that industry used raw cotton from the Levant. Um, with the arrival of Europeans in the Americas, the possibility arose of using raw cotton from the New World. Which, was a, which included different species. And those species tended to have a longer staple, a longer fiber length, which made it easier in the sense of quicker to spin them into fine yarns. Um, and you'll see there I've, I've just mapped out the, the different average uh, typical fiber lengths. But it's striking that it's only the English who took up New World cottons on any scale before the 1740s. And they did that really from the middle of the 17th century. So they had almost almost 100 year lead on other European countries in the use of these uh, new world cottons, which allowed uh, which European spinners to produce uh, finer, finer yarns more easily, more quickly. Um, these of course were produced principally in the West Indies uh, by enslaved people. Uh, starting off in Barbados. Why did the British use them when others didn't? Well, principally because from in 1660, the British or the English at that stage got rid of all the tariffs on raw cotton from their West Indian colonies. So basically the British are already adopting a mercantilist policy towards uh, the supply of raw materials for their cotton industries from the middle of the 17th century onwards. And not only do they remove all import tariffs on raw cotton, making it considerably cheaper and making it possible to compete with Levant cotton, they also put up high tariffs on imports of cotton yarn from elsewhere. And there is never the development of a large scale trade in imported cotton yarn from India uh, in contrast to uh, what happens particularly in the Netherlands, uh, where, where cotton from, uh, I mean, uh, 10 times as much cotton is imported from uh, India and modern Indonesia into the Netherlands than is imported into Britain. Well, that's the raw material. If Let's think about spinning yarn from that raw material. Um, in spinning cotton, different places adopted different tools and different techniques, and their choices were shaped by a combination of factors, the quality of raw cotton, the cost of labor, the kind of products that were in demand. In India, labor uh, was relatively cheap, at least nominally, uh, in silver prices. There was, uh, there was also vast quantities of relatively cheap short staple cotton, uh, they used principally the small spinning wheel you see here on the right, uh, or for finer counts, um, the hand spindle. Uh, 
and they produce the whole range of yarn counts for a huge range of fabrics, although most production for European markets was relatively coarse, and they spun both warp and weft. In Europe, there was a problem spinning cotton warps. Now, it's sometimes said that Europeans couldn't spin cotton warp. In fact, a lot of cotton warp was spun, but because warp had to have a high twist, it took longer to spin and labor costs were higher. And it was much cheaper to substitute linen yarn in the warp. Um, and I think the key issue here was cost. Um, in France, labor costs were high. They used largely short staple Levant cotton. The demand was for coarser fabrics. And they tended to use this big wheel, the big, the, the great wheel as used in the woolen industry. And you see that on the uh, on the left. In, in Britain, in England, in Lancashire in particular, labor costs again were relatively high. They were using mainly new world raw cotton, longer staple, suitable for finer fabrics. And they developed a specialized production system for dealing with that raw material, which involved two spinnings. So first of all, uh, the, uh, they, the, 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 the cotton was coarse spun uh, on one wheel by one woman, and then it was fine spun on another wheel by another woman, and the women tended to specialize in one or the other, and you can see that in the center here. And how people learn to spin is, well, is, is obscure. I mean, spinning cotton was well known in Italy by in, in, in the later Middle Ages, similarly in Germany, um, it was spread by people uh, emigrating. We don't know exactly how that worked, but certainly in the 18th century, there is a big contrast between uh, Britain and France. Uh, the French tend to bring people in to teach new cotton spinning techniques. They bring people in from Malta, they bring people in from the Ottoman Empire, and finally in the 1780s, they bring people in from India. The English don't do that at all. In fact, the English receive very relatively little information on what's actually going on in terms of techniques in India. Uh, there's not many P English reports. The East India Company doesn't collect information in the way some French uh, agents do. Um, in England, a lot of what's done seems to be a, take the form of a kind of reverse engineering. They learn from the products. Okay, well, finally, let me turn uh, to pattern design and fashion. Now, it's often assumed that the patterns printed on calicos, and especially what, what, what by the mid 18th century were being called chintzes, were Indian. Now, I don't think that's strictly true. In Mediterranean Europe, printed cottons were being imported in the 17th century from the Levant, and of course, in the Levant and in various parts of the Middle East, Indian coloring techniques had been acquired much earlier. So there is a sense in which what's coming to Europe from the Levant has an Indian influence, but it's an influ Indian influence that's been in reinterpreted via uh, the Middle East. And there's no doubt that in the 17th century, there was a European taste for Asian exoticism. And Europeans were already sending designs to India to be printed or painted. And what was going on here, and this is this is the big argument in the 1950s over bizarre silks with John uh, Erwin and so on that I've Erwin and so on that I've already mentioned. The question was, what was the right sort of exoticism for the market? What was the exoticism that conformed to European taste and fashions? And that's what the argument was about. How much of it was Asian? How much of it was a kind of English uh, or European uh, reconstitution or, or, or indeed constitution uh, of Asianness? Now, by the mid 18th century, the patterns printed on English chintzes and calicos were said to be, quote, for the generality in imitation after the fashion of the flowered silk manufactory. And indeed, designers who worked on commission for Spitalfields manufacturers of loom pattern silks also supplied designs for textile printers in the vicinity 
of London. And you can see the similarity between uh, here one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, printed cottons in the uh, Hoker album and an Anna uh, Maria Garthwaite design of the same era for a brocaded silk. Now, all 13 chintz cottons printed in the Hoka Livre were printed near London with designs adapted from the fashionable Spitalfield silks of the years around 1750. Now, printing and penciling a design on a cotton textile couldn't, of course, reproduce the texture, the sheen, the intensity of colour and the sheer luxuriousness of an equivalent design woven in silk although printed fabrics were often glazed to give them a silk-like luster. Nevertheless, a printed adaptation of a silk design, something like what you see on the slide, was more affordable, easier to clean, and could be produced quickly, ensuring it was fashionably up to date. I mean, the price per yard would be you know, a quarter or a fifth, uh, or, or even less proportionately uh, for the cotton on the left, uh, as opposed to the brocaded silk on the right. Now, the chintzes Hoka selected for the leave reflected the priorities of his French employer, Daniel Charles Pruden, uh, who'd been recently appointed director du, du commerce in France. Most fabrics printed in Britain in the mid 18th century were crude and simple, executed cheaply in one or two colors on coarser fabric. These designs, the sort you see here from the Foundling uh, Hospital collection, don't appear in Hoka's album. Truden had already in 1749, before being introduced to Hoka, begun to support initiatives to remove the prohibition on printed textiles in France. Uh, so he's interested in reviving the French printing industry. And one element in the case he promoted for ending the prohibition was what he considered to be the well-known and well-established superiority of French textile design, especially silk textile design, uh, which it was argued would enable France to export printed fabrics more successfully than its competitors. So he's saying if ever, only they could do, do prints on cotton, France would triumph because its prints on cotton would be far, far aesthetically superior to any other competitor. Um, now, the costly polychrome silk derived designs of Hoka's chintz cottons printed, therefore offered a model for this new French printing industry, particularly as English chintzes of the early 1750s were already incorporating French design influences. It was said, quote, the fashion of late, as with the brocaded silks, has run upon natural flowers, stalks and leaves with ornaments after the French taste. So the, the English silk weavers were already copying the French. So Hoka could very easily suggest that uh, it would be good. Uh, it, it would, could Hoka could encourage Truden uh, to think that it would be a good idea to encourage French printing on textiles. But Hoka wasn't being entirely candid with Truden about the fabric for his samples of chintz cottons printed. And here we come back to the problem of words and things. Basically, Hoka was lying. He stated his chintz cottons printed were all Lancashire made cottons with a linen warp and a cotton weft, the ones that were legal to print on in, and, and wear in Britain. In fact, three of the textiles he included in the album are printed on what's almost certainly Indian calico, with Z quit twist cotton for both warp and weft. And all cotton calicos like these were being printed legally in the print works around London, but for export to the British colonies in the Americas, to Africa, and to continental Europe, often with the same designs and colors used on the cotton linen fabrics, the cotton linen prints uh, that were allowed to be sold on the domestic market. And including these three printed calicos in the album served to emphasize the quality of English printing and finishing. Printed colors tended to be richer and more uniform on all cotton fabrics than on cotton linen mixtures. You can see here that in the top left hand corner, the dye takes far less well on the shiny vertical um, linen threads than it does on the horizontal cotton threads. Whereas in the bottom right hand corner, there's one of these all cotton, almost certainly Indian 
uh, calicos printed in London, and there the take up of the dye is much more uniform. Um, so including these three printed calicos in the album secretly without, without notifying his French masters that that's what he'd done, served to emphasize the quality of English printing and finishing because the, because the colors were so much richer. Uh, where, well, where, whereas the take up of the dye on yarn spun from two different fibers was inconsistent. And moreover, all cotton calicos could be heavily glazed uh, to produce the uniform silk mimicking gloss found on these three samples. I think you can just see here that the, the surface of the one on the, on the right is quite crushed. And that's because it, it was possible to glaze these all cotton fabrics much more heavily than you could with the linen cotton mixtures. Okay, well, let me conclude. So I suppose one of the key things we learned from our close examination of the materiality of the textile swatches in the Hoka album, particularly the textiles, uh, the, text, the printed cottons and calicos in the Hoka album. What we learned was not about textiles at all, but about how to be a successful industrial spy. Building a successful career in 18th century industrial espionage required more than an intimate understanding of industrial processes and techniques. It required a clear-eyed ability to ingratiate oneself with power brokers in a manner appropriate to the host country, while covertly manipulating the hopes and fears of powerful patrons by dissimulating, shall we say. Hoka wasn't the first Lancashire textile manufacturer to be seduced by the French government into coming to France. John Kay, the famous inventor of the flying shuttle, offered his services to the French some years before Hoka. He was a brilliant textile engineer, but he was brittle, vain, greedy, and unwilling to bow and scrape to Trudem, Hoka's boss. In other words, he lacked the necessary skills to succeed in France. John Hoka, his fellow Lancastrian, possessed them in spades. Thank you. And there's the man himself. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, um, for your uh, very enlightening paper. Uh, <coughs> if you want, you can stop sharing so I uh, would okay. see uh, if you might want to ask you a question. As people are gathering their thoughts, I'll just show the cover of the book. <laughs> oh, oh, is it disappearing to the background? There you go. Yeah. Um, so that's the book um, that uh, John and I um, have been working on and in which you have the facsimile and uh, different articles or chapters by um, textile historians and historians from both sides of the uh, channel and even the Atlantic. Um, I think it is just about to be available uh, in America and Britain, uh, but it is already available in France. Um, okay, um, has anybody got a question for uh, Courtney? Do you want to start? Hi, uh, thank Hi. you so much for this talk, John. Uh, really great. Um, my question is why the French wouldn't have requested um, samples specifically of textiles that were being printed for export that were on the 100% cotton materials. And was that because they also intended to print on blended fabrics as they kind of got their own industry off the ground? Um, so just something I was curious about. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, that's a good question because I mean, and 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 behind it is a is a wider question. Why do they even bother getting Hoka? You know, Hoka goes to Britain. He, he's 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 a Jacobite. He was involved in the uh, in the Bonnie Prince Charlie Rebellion in 1745. 
he is, he's, 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 he's captured, imprisoned. He probably have been tried for treason and hanged, but he escaped from prison and went to France. I mean, his whole story is quite extraordinary. And uh, we, we recount it in the book. Um, so, and he has to go back to Britain on what's quite a dangerous mission um, to collect these textiles. So you might say, well, why didn't the French just, you know, the, the British probably have the biggest export industry in textiles in Western Europe. You could buy them in the Netherlands, in Italy, and, you know, the, 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 there may have been problems getting them in France, okay, particularly during wartime. But, you know, they, they were not, not inaccessible. You could buy them anywhere. The British were very keen to sell them. Um, and I think, so I think what's going on is that I think Tuden wants, it, it, it's again about politics and it's about working the system. Trudeau wants someone who is expert uh, from Lancashire to put together a, a representative group of what the British industry can achieve. And it's not clear that just going to Amsterdam and buying a few British textiles would give you that. So what he's but what he's paying for, um, and he and and Hoka goes to England on this dangerous mission with an expense account, and we have we have his expenses claim that he submitted when he got back. So we know exactly what he was getting, and it, it's it's a kind of. It's it's his expert. It, it's a selection put together by an expert, and that's what they're getting. So yes, they're they th but but it's interesting that the expert doesn't tell them, <laughs> and exactly what what and and it's quite possible that pe people like to then, you know, although they wouldn't really have grasped the significance. And it's true that the French textile industry, people like Jouy, uh, Oberkampf at Jouy goes on printing both on cotton linen and on all cotton, even though there's no regulations about that in France once the prohibition is lifted. I mean, again, it, it shows that one of the key reasons for printing, for making a lot of cotton linens is that it's just cheaper because linen's cheap, linen yarn is cheap. I mean, it's largely in France, it, a lot of it comes from very poor areas like Brittany. In England, it comes from Ireland or the Eastern Eastern Baltic, where again labor is extremely cheap. So, as I say, I think a lot of the the reason for the particular mix of fabrics is political. Maybe, just if I may, just to um, uh, to go off that, I, I, uh, listening to you, I was um, curious to know your thoughts about whether one of the appeals of um, commissioning Holka uh, was also in a way to get the tandem between the thing and the vocabulary that goes with it. Because if you go to Amsterdam and buy it um, in a shop or a wholesaler, maybe you're not going to have that link between the word and the thing as much as you would get it if you ask a professional, an, an expert, somebody who's been in the industry. Um, to not only bring you the thing, but actually be able, at least you trust, uh, to tell you what they are, what they go by. Um, so I was wondering whether that might, what your thoughts were on that. I, had, I hadn't thought of that before, but. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, that, that I mean, oh, it, the, the, one of the things we did when we were putting this together is we thought spent quite a lot of time thinking about, as you, as you know, Ariane, we th spent quite a lot of time thinking about trade catalogues and sample books. And you look at sample books of roughly short the periods shortly afterwards from Manchester, and all they have is a number. Each there are lots of swatches, but each swatch has a number, <laughs> and that's because then the you know the the people in the, there's a secrecy issue on the part of the manufacturer. But I think more importantly, their whole their tools in wholesaling, and wholesale merchants knew the market and they knew what these things were and they knew which they wanted and which they didn't. But yes, you're absolutely right because the the commentary why, why this is such a great a great object as as a book is that the commentary is there to provide a, a constantly an explanation of why this particular Lancashire product is better than the equivalent French one. 
And Hoka does that over and over again. Uh, it's very striking that the commentary is one that's designed to explain why the French should be doing it this way, because that will produce a better product. And you see that Hoka later go, for those of you who are not familiar, goes on to become the leading industrial civil servant in France. And he's ennobled and becomes a wealthy man. Um, and as a senior civil servant, he, he, he goes around France looking at all sorts of textile industries, not just cotton, lots of woolens and so on. And he's very critical uh, of many of these things. But when he goes to the silk throwing factories uh, of uh, southeast France, uh, which are all built on, which are big water powered mills, uh, very up to date, built on the latest principles, he has nothing but praise. He, he's, he said, this is you know, wonderful, very well constructed, doing a great job. So you do get the sense that um, a lot of his commentary is targeted at explaining to French senior officials how you produce the English, superior English textile. Uh, and, that's, that's what, and that's why they're buying his expertise. I think that's absolutely right. Thank you. Alka? Hi. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really very interesting. And congratulations to you and Ariane uh, for the book. Um, my question is, is uh, stemming from sheer curiosity. Um, as you mentioned, the French were more open to learning from other um, uh, parts of the world, uh, cultures, and, and other people. Uh, you mentioned Malta um, and the Ottoman, uh, as well as India. Uh, in the context of spinning. Um, is there any evidence that they also did this for printing and dyeing? Uh, surely Holker's um, um, engagement with the French is not the first time that they are attempting to uh, learn how to be able to replicate um, these printing and dyeing techniques onto cotton cloth. So um, could you perhaps speak a little bit about the other attempts that they may have done? Uh, and and, and in terms of expertise, if that's what they're uh, aiming to be able to obtain from uh, such encounters, then did they try to learn from the Indians themselves? Well, I th yes, I mean, they do, in the sense that there are French officials who make these visits to India and record a lot of information about how the dyeing and printing or painting process is done. And these are these fame. There are a series of famous uh, uh, manuscript books, which uh, Giorgio Ariello writes about them, and and Pras uh, and Parasasi, uh, and the other authors on on Indian textiles. But at the same time, I think they're already primed to do that because they have this intimate link with the Eastern Mediterranean. And so there are, you know, that a lot of the printing in the Ottoman Empire is done by Armenians, and you 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 get a transfer of Armenian workers into Marseille and into other parts of France earlier on. I mean, which uh, Olivier Ravo has studied to some extent, uh, but there's, uh, I mean, it's all. Uh, my impression. I mean, I'm no expert on this, but my impression is that. There's probably more going on in the later 17th century than we actually know, because, of course, it's Armenian uh, pain painters and colorists who come to Amsterdam and set up early print works in Amsterdam in the 1670s. Um, so that, that that whole world of a kind of international Armenian you know, skill network, which also extends eastwards into because of the Armenian center in Isfahan, where the 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 the, the, the Persian uh, emperors force the the Armenian population of the Persian Empire to concentrate in Isfahan, and that again I understand becomes a major printing center. So that that and and there are Armenian connections then eastwards into South Asia. So that that that's a kind of live. Um, a kind of live network uh, transferring skills. But the, my impression is that England's fairly peripheral to that. I mean, there are Armenians in England, in London in the mid 17th century, but um, I, haven't, I don't think anyone's found a lot of evidence that they're 
uh, especially prominent in textile dyeing and printing. Um, and in a, which in a way is slightly surprising because the, the, in the later 17th century, the, uh, the English trade with the Levant is quite considerable. And also there's a very intimate relationship with the Dutch in Amsterdam. Um, but in the 18th century, clearly the dominant trading force in the Mediterranean from, from, from west to east is the French. Uh, so it's not surprising that those links go on being important through into the, into the 18th century. But that's something, uh, I, yeah, it's, I, I mean, for instance, the Dutch collect astonishing statistics on Indian production in the 1680s. <laughs> and yet, as far as I know, none of it's about dyeing and coloring. It's all about, you know, classifications of fabrics and spinning and yarns and so on. So uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done on, on all that. Thank you. Could I ask a question, please? Sunaina? <clears throat> yeah, of course, go for it. Okay, let me just start my, so you can see me. So <laughs> I'm, I'm very interested in all things related to the spinning wheel and spinning. So my question is related to uh, your observation. Uh, you told us that there, there would be a woman who would first spin coarse yarn and then another one who would spin the same coarse yarn and make it finer, is that what? That's right. Mm -hmm. the, the Lancashire, this system seems to have, I've in fact seen nowhere else where this existed. I mean, it's not to say it didn't exist elsewhere, but the only documented evidence I've seen is, is from Lancashire. And it seems to have been particularly applied to, um, to using these new world uh, long staple cottons Long for staple. for counts i mean especially for higher counts so counts above about 16 in the uh, 16 cotton count any 16 um yes and you'd so you'd spin it to about cotton count one two or three on the course wheel and then you'd spin it to, then then produce a long roving now, of course, one of the advantages of that, when it if if you depending on how you look at on mechanization, is that once you move to mechanization, you already have in place a a production system that's based around long rovings, and as soon as you you're mechanized production, that's what you need. So, in a sense, there's a there's a, there's a you know that's an important step. It's it's one of the things that makes it. Uh, that explains why mechanization was likely to happen in Lancashire, because they already have the preparatory process that you need for mechanized production. Because what in France clearly what happened was they spun the cotton on these big on these great wheels, um, and they'd spun it from just uh, sli uh, small small slivers of cotton. So they would card the cotton. You'd hold the the the, the spinner would hold. Mm -hmm. a small amount in one hand mm -hmm. and then spin it. Uh, but the Lancashire system, and, the, and, and Hoka talks about this in his correspondence and you get the, he talks about some, what he calls, he says they don't mix the two. And he talks about something he calls the spinner's hand, which I think is a lovely phrase, which captures that you have to have, you know, you have to develop the manual skills, the finger skills yeah. for yeah. spinning either coarse or fine but you try not to mix the two because you and i think actually the one the one who gets paid most as according to hoka is the coarse spinner because you've got to get the roving right to be able to produce the fine yarn quickly and english spinning british spinning and hoka's uh, talks about this a lot it's all about speed um you know, they they for instance in wo in woolens and worsteds they spin worsteds on the great wheel, the one I showed the, the, the French spinning cotton on. Whereas in most of Europe, worsteds are spun on a flyer a flyer wheel rather than a spindle wheel. Um, and he says that's basically because actually it's much quicker to do it on the great wheel as long as you're prepared to almost run. So they, you know, they walk back or other, and uh, it makes for much quicker spinning. So speed, speed is of the essence because speed is money when it comes to paying for spinning. 
Very interesting. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, Tim. Hello, just unmuting myself. <laughs> Hello, John. Nice to see Hi, you. Very nice Thank to see you. Thank you very much for your wise words, as ever. Um, I was trying to think of a, of a question, and I can't help, uh, as you might imagine, being interested in the weaving aspect of these mm. uh, textiles. And I wondered if you could say a bit more. I didn't quite um, understand, but it's very interesting, this idea of this um, uh, this idea of, of a cloth that's made of, it's a union of cotton and yeah. linen, and somehow it kind of creeps around the regulations. And uh, we're also talking here about Lancashire and the importance of, of a Lancashire kind of spinning system. So I was wondered if you could say a bit more about how that um, kind of cloth production hierarchy uh, is maybe being controlled. It's a sort of another layer of the, of the complexity. Yeah. <laughs> um, the weaving of this of this union cloth and the idea of warp and weft and yeah well i mean why it happens in lancashire has clearly got a lot to do with the fact that fustian manufacture is taken up in lancashire so that i mean the key to all this going back is this this the is the development of this fabric fustian which is the name is explains where it came from it's fusta it's named after fustat in egypt and it came to Italy in the 12th century, so in the Middle Ages. And what's distinctive about it is that it's all, not always, but almost always a union, a linen warp, cotton weft fabric. Um, and why I think it's so attractive, I mean, this Italian, my Italian expert fellow colleagues tell me that it's probably because it, it kind of mimics woolen fabrics, but is much lighter. So is good for summer wear uh, in Italy and for certain sorts of summer bedding. Uh, and that's what it's used for in Italy in the later Middle Ages. And what's distinctive about fustian is that it's a twill weave. It's a, it's a quasi, as the French say, almost always. Not all, not all the time, but mostly. Um, and so that uh, moves from Italy to Germany, and then it's developed in England uh, from the beginning of the 17th century. And again, that year 1660 that I mentioned, when the tariffs, the customs duties were reduced, they're also all export duties on are removed from fustians that year. There's obviously a kind of state backing for this, this Lancashire fustian industry. You, 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 you make the raw materials cheap, you make sure that it's easy to export it. It's 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 treated a bit like the woolen industry as, as a national priority already in the 17th century. So they produce everything from heavy fustians to dimities, all these fabric, great range of fabrics. And then there's this incursion of these Indian fabrics, but they're all plain weave. Well, not again, I'm, I'm exaggerating. They're they're largely plain weave. Um, and that's why that's what allows them to get under the regulations because what the what the woolen and and silk interests wanted was just to ban all these Indian fabrics altogether but then you know what so the the Lancashire people very craftily said well actually we're going to start making these things and then they said you know well they're actually like the old fustians well they weren't like the old fustians because they were plain we they were the same mixture of of linen and, and cotton, but the mix, they were a plain weave, whereas the old fustians were almost all twill weave, which you will understand as a weaver. Uh, and that's how they got round it. Now, whether that was intended at, at the time parliament passed the legislation, because remember the people sitting in parliament um, passing these laws, I mean, like sometimes today, knew absolutely, had absolutely nil detailed knowledge of what it was all about, really, in terms of the hand-on priorities of weaving. But they did, they, they, they had to let the linen industry uh, be allowed to go on printing fabric because Ireland and Scotland, which were, to, you know, the, 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 the union between England and Scotland had only just happened. So there were all sorts of political reasons for encouraging the linen industries in those periphery in Celtic Britain, as it were. 
and Lancashire kind of gets in as well through that. But yes, it's a kind of sleight of hand because they say it's our old fustian industry, but actually they're innovating very, very rapidly. And they're innovating not just in terms of these Indian imitations. That's one big block of, 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 of innovations. But they're also innovating in the old fustians. So they start making these, in the 1740s, cotton velvets, lots of cotton velvets in Hoka's album. Again, something that's undercutting the silk industry, undercutting aspects of the worsted industry. Um, and, you know, Lancashire is an extraordinarily innovative place in the first half of the 18th century. Uh, lots of copying, lots of native innovation. You know, the French bureaucrats, when Ho when they realize who Hoka is, that he's this exile with enormous expertise in the Lancashire industry. I mean, I think they must, they gradually come to understand that they've hit gold because they've got someone who's, a, he was a textile finisher, a calendrar, which meant that he'd actually spent time working with cottons, with linens, with woolens, with everything. He has this kind of encyclopedic knowledge of what's going on in Lancashire. Uh, it's a gift. And then he goes on to be the man who essentially introduces the spinning jenny to France, introduces the Arkwright's water frame to France, pushes through the flying shuttle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, he's 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 been described as the most important single figure in industrial espionage in the 18th century. And there's some truth in that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have a, maybe a one last question? If not, um, well, let me thank John again um, for his paper and his uh, very rich answers to the uh, questions um, in that little exchange, uh, or um, not just little, but this exchange, <laughs> <laughs> you know, touching on um, spinning and um, weaving. And um, I like to. I like the idea that the webinar has made somebody want to pick up um, uh, cotton spinning, as um, one of the comments in the chat box says. <laughs> uh, so um, thank you very much again for your paper and your thoughts. Um, and um, goodbye, everybody. And wherever you are in whichever <laughs> part of the world, <laughs> whether this is morning or evening, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Ariane, and thank you, everybody, for coming. My apologies for my slight uh, hiccups with Zoom, but we got there in the end. We did. Bye-bye. <laughs>